Well, hi, everybody. My name is Jason Cusick. I'm the pastor here at Journey Faith, and hello to everybody at our Torrance campus. We love you guys. We just watched the announcement from last week of Pastor Alex explaining the permanent campus. We just prayed about that also. So excited that we can be doing ministry together. Also want to say hi to everybody that's watching us online or you're watching us on Facebook Live. Great that you can join us this morning. Um, I'm really excited because we're starting a new series of messages called On Earth As In Heaven. That's a kind of a weird phrase, but it's actually a quote taken from the Lord's Prayer, Jesus' signature prayer that has been prayed for thousands of years to people all over the world in different countries and different languages. And we're going to be spending six weeks kind of unpacking each line of the Lord's Prayer leading up to Easter. So on the Christian calendar, this is a season called Lent. And it's normally a season of reflection and connection with God and, and rededication to God. Now, some of you might have grown up praying the Lord's Prayer, and it's a very significant part of your spiritual life. And so I'm hoping this series is going to just really be amazing for you and nurturing for you, really encouraging. Others of you grew up and you know the Lord's Prayer, or maybe you've prayed it for years, but it was kind of just rote and ritual. Like, it, it doesn't mean a lot. You know it, but it doesn't have the kind of depth. And what I'm hoping is each week as we unpack each line it's going to have new meaning and new significance to you. There's a third group, and it might be like me years ago. Either you don't pray at all, and if you are going to pray or talk to God, it's going to be spontaneous and in your own words. It's not going to be praying someone else's prayer. And for those of you who might be in that camp, um, I'm hoping that this is going to really give you an insight into how beautiful a pre-written prayer is, and actually how significant it is to hear Jesus's advice or Jesus's suggestions on how to pray. And the way we're teaching this is not as a prescription of prayer, but a description of prayer, describing the kinds of things that Jesus feels are important as we're going to God in prayer. Now, as when we were creating this series, we actually started with a question behind the scenes as we were talking about this. Here was the question we had. How can we grow closer to God and still make a difference in the world? Because sometimes we, we, we teeter one way or another. We're like, oh, I'm all about my relationship with God, but maybe my relationship with other people is really not that good. Or maybe I'm not really impacting my community. Or we're super big on making sure relationships are right and impacting the world but we don't really feel that connected to God. How do we answer this question? Well, we said, let's go to Jesus. Jesus had this profound spiritual intimacy with God and yet was this agent of hope and compassion and justice. So each week we'll look at a part of Jesus's signature prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and then at the end of each service, at the end of each message, we're, we're gonna pray that prayer together. Now, some of you learned this prayer with a more formal style, with the these and the thous, and others of you might have said this prayer in a much more contemporary uh, style. Just to let you know, the version we're, we're going to be praying together is, is going to come from a version of the Bible called the New International Version. We feel like this is kind of a good middle ground for the Elizabethan English and the super contemporary kind of 21st century language. Um, but I'm going to actually have the Lord's Prayer written on a screen. So you know, you know, if you're new and you're like, I don't even know what this Lord's Prayer thing is you're talking about, um, we'll have it on the screen and we'll kind of pray it together. Here's the main idea for this first week. Praying the Lord's Prayer can help us have a closer relationship with God. That's how it starts. And that's actually at the, at the beginning of the prayer. Um, but where does the Lord's Prayer come from? When did Jesus share this? Well, if we look into the pages of the New Testament, we have uh, a book in the New Testament written by a guy named Luke. And Luke was one of Jesus' early followers. And he recorded some, some teachings and some of the life of Jesus. And here's what he tells us in the 11th chapter of his book. He says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. 
just as John taught his disciples. Now, Jesus, it's not like Jesus' disciples didn't know how to pray. They knew how to pray. In fact, in first century Judaism, there were traditional prayers that, that Jewish people would pray all the time. But when religious leaders popped up and rabbis popped up, sometimes they said, here's how I pray, or here's how I suggest. And John the Baptist is one of those people back in first century Palestine um, that had a particular prayer. We don't have it written for us today, but the disciples knew it. Hey, John the Baptist disciples pray. Why don't you teach us to pray? Now, what's interesting about this verse here, and it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When we read the New Testament, we find Jesus often went by himself to isolated places and prayed alone. So I think what was happening here is the disciples were here, Jesus was over there, and, and they, maybe they were in eye shot but not ear shot, and they saw him in a certain place, and maybe they heard, and they were like, what's he saying? What, what, what is Jesus praying about? I want to know. I had a real funny story a couple of, uh, couple of months ago related to this. So my wife, Marie, prays at the end of the day. So it's kind of how she wraps up her day, wraps up all the things that she's been thinking about, and she prays at the end of the day. Now, she normally prays quietly or in silence, so I really don't even hear what she prays about. Well, about two months ago, I wake up, it's 2.30 in the morning, and I hear her praying. And I'm like, well, this must be serious. She's praying out loud. What's going on? So I kind of listen in, and she's, she's, she's like got her teeth gritted, and she's kind of mumbling a little bit. And then I realize she's still asleep, and she's praying in her sleep. And I'm like, what is she saying? What, what, what is that? I can't make it out. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get my phone and record this. So <laughs> I, I got my phone. It's about a two-and-a-half-minute prayer while she was asleep. And I, I'm, I'm recording it, trying to translate it the next day. So Marie reluctantly allowed me to play part of this for you <laughs> today. And it, so it's not, a long, it's not a long thing. It's only the end of the prayer. Um, take a listen to my wife praying while she's asleep. And uh, that very blessed, I was successful. Thank you. Thank you. I love how she ended it. That's the best way. Because then she was silent after that. Best way to end a prayer. Thank you. We have a joke in our house now. Every time we say thank you to each other, it's always, thank you. It's always like this. But I was sitting there like, what is she saying? What is she leaving out? What's important to her? I think that's what was happening with the disciples. Jesus, I can't, I can't hear what you're saying. What are you saying? What should we pray about? What should we leave out? What's important to you? So then they say, teach us to pray. Here's what Jesus says. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. It's not the only time that Jesus taught prayer. There's actually another reference in another book of the New Testament where he taught at another time. Here's what he says. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What we're going to do, what I want to do is just, just break down that first sentence. Let's just unpack that. What did Jesus intend for us to be thinking and feeling and praying just in that first line? And I want to share with you three things that are in just this first line, give you some action steps, some suggestions about what you can do, and then we're going to pray it together before we move into a song at the end of our service. Here's the first thing. It says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't start with, oh, sacred God of the universe, distant and true. He doesn't start with, oh, source of power, omnipotent and omnivorous, or whatever the omni words are. You know, like, like it, it's not this distance and remove thing. It's something so personal. It's Father. We start from a place not of fear, but we start with a place of family. 
one other New Testament writer put it this way. He says, you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. You know what that word Abba means? I looked up Abba on the internet. You know what I found? I found a Swedish pop band from the 70s <laughs> that sang Dancing Queen. That's not what this is referring to at all. Uh, I looked a little bit further, and I found that the word Abba means daddy in Hebrew. That's the first line of the Lord's Prayer. Daddy. And the beautiful thing in this picture is he uses, uh, the writer here who is Paul, one of the early church leaders, he describes a relationship that we have with God in adoption terms. If you uh, have adopted a child, um, on behalf of everybody here, thank you so much. Thank you for reaching out and bringing a child into your life. Um, you were in the adoption process or in the adoption process, or if you're headed toward that, you're modeling probably one of the most dramatic New Testament metaphors for God's love for us. Because here's the idea. God created each and every one of us human beings, and we are all part of God's good creation. But God didn't stop there. He said, I don't want you to just be a part of my creation. I want you to be my child. And so when we say yes to God's love and forgiveness through Jesus, it's like God says, now you are my children, and now you can call me daddy. And so in that opening line of the Lord's Prayer, we say, our Father. And what God wants for us is to do this, to embrace God as your loving heavenly Father. Now, as I say that, let me just stop for a moment and recognize there are many of us in this room who have had negative experiences, possibly be even abused and victimized by fathers, men, authority figures, sometimes even religious leaders, myself included. When you hear the phrase father, that might have a bit of a sting to it. I said, what do I do with that? I was talking to a counselor years ago and asking her this question. What do we do with that? And that the sting that can come for some of us with that term father. And, and she said to me, now, let's, let's not be too discriminatory. Some of us have the sting even for the term mother or any authority figure. But she said, here's what I think God is inviting us to do. God's inviting us to try to move one step closer to him to heal and, and recover from whatever wounds that we have that negatively impact our view of God and not avoid words that might trigger us. So God's inviting us to lean into it. As parents, part of our job as parents is to, is to present to our children an image of God's loving care through our parenting. We're not perfect at it. We make all kinds of mistakes. If you don't have children of your own, you as an older person to a child are communicating to that child something about God's nature. So when they get to a point of having a personal relationship with God, they'll go, oh, I know what it means to have a loving person in authority over me that cares about me because I know my mom, my dad, my grandparents, my neighbor, that guy at the church. God's wanting us to heal and grow. But in this first line, we see an invitation to experience God as our loving Heavenly Father. Here's an action step for you as you're praying this prayer. Ask God to help you feel and know his caring love for you. Both of those are important. Sometimes you know it, but you don't feel it. That's okay, but maybe you can ask God to help me to actually feel it. Sometimes you feel it, temporarily, but you really don't know it. That's okay too, but you need to say, God, help me to understand your fatherly, caring love for me. Maybe that's through 
reading more of the Bible to get a bigger picture of God's love for you. Maybe it means talking with some, some close friends about that. Maybe it means going to see a counselor and processing some of the hurts you've experienced in the past so that you can experience more of God's loving care for you. That's the first, our Father. Then Jesus does something really interesting. Look what he says next. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. While we can experience God as our Father, love, intimacy, friendship, connection, family, very much with us right here, then Jesus says there's another side to it. God's not only with us here, but God's also other. God's also not like us. We are imperfect. God is perfect. We have sin and dysfunction in our life. God is sinless and whole. So he says, in heaven, uses directional language. Back in the day when Jesus was speaking, people would look up into the sky and they just saw dots in the sky and they were kind of unclear what was beyond that. And what was beyond that was mysterious and powerful and unknown. And we're still experiencing that. We can send satellites out, but even further than that, we're kind of like, I still don't understand what's going on there. And that idea is a reminder that while God's with me, God is also different than me. In theology, we talk about how God is imminent and transcendent. Here's a picture uh, based on an, a, a beautiful icon that one of our artists here did at the church. God is imminent, meaning God is permanently pervading and sustaining the universe. When we talk about God's eminence, it means God is here, working in and through creation and in and through our lives, speaking and guiding and directing our lives. And yet at the same time, God is transcendent, beyond the limits of ordinary experience, in some ways mysterious, and, and there are aspects of God that are unknowable. Jesus is saying we need to, encount, we need to um, uh, experience God and, as our, and embrace God as our loving Heavenly Father, and at the same time, we do this. We exalt God as holy. To exalt means to lift up. While we say, God, you are with me and you're my father, yet you are also perfect and holy and, and different than I am. In fact, he even expands this a little bit. He says this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's an interesting word. When I first started reading the Bible, I read the Lord's Prayer in different translations, and almost all of them kept using this old English word, hallowed. Um, and I think there's something uh, special about that word. I, ironically, you know what the word hallowed means? To hallow something means to set something apart as special. The, most translations, they don't even change that word. They just, you know, let's keep hallowed, hallowed, you know? Now, when some of you look at this word, you think, is that like Halloween? Yes, it is, actually. Let me give you a little history lesson. The holiday we celebrate as Halloween has its origins in religious practices in um, Celtic folk religion and some Roman religion and kind of earth-based religions. And as Christianity began spreading throughout the world, uh, Christian leaders and churches, people would come to Jesus and they'd start following Jesus, but there were these holidays that were celebrations of death. And so what Christians did is Christians said, could we put a spin on that? Could we say, this is a holiday about death, but it's actually a holiday, maybe we could celebrate our loved ones and great spiritual people that have died and have gone to be with God, and we'll call it All Hallows' Eve, or Hallows' Evening. And so it was renamed Halloween with the idea we're going to celebrate. Now, on Halloween, we will celebrate Christians who have died and gone to be with the Lord. Well, that didn't work, because Halloween's still Halloween, right? It didn't work to take over that holiday. But that's where we get the phrase Halloween from. The idea is there's something special it's different than our ordinary experience. It's a special day. It's a special idea. Let me give you a, a little example of what it means 
for something to be hallowed. I'm going to show you a picture in a moment. And when I show you this image, I just want you to silently note what you are thinking and feeling when you see this image. Okay, here's the image. Okay, what was going on in you? I'll bet you there was a moment where you suddenly got serious. You might have gotten sad. You probably thought about life and death. You probably, some of you had a moment where you were like, you know, life could end at any moment. Some of you thought, you know, life is precious. This is important. Some of you didn't know what to feel. All you knew was that you were supposed to be quiet in that moment. Now, I'm not saying... Kobe Bryant's God and Kobe Bryant's holy and now he's God in heaven. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is that's the experience of hollowing. Jesus says when you start to pray, first you say, our Father, and there's this intimacy, and then you shift into in heaven, hallowed be your name. In Judaism, a name was equivalent to a person. You are holy, special. So when you pray, here's an action step for you. Take a moment of silence in honor of God's holiness. Maybe that's before the prayer. Maybe before you pray, you just kind of quiet yourself. Maybe during the prayer, when you hit certain words that are heavy, like deliver us, forgive us, hallowed be your name, you just kind of stop. Kind of soak in the seriousness of that. Maybe after you pray, you just spend a moment in quietness remembering you just talk to the God of the universe. Or maybe throughout the prayer, you have kind of a a, a stillness uh, to you. Um, Christians back in the first century had this Greek word, um, hysukios. It means quietness or stillness. We read about in the New Testament, it says uh, to Christians, it said, live your life in quietness. It doesn't mean to never say anything. It means to have a, a peaceness, a, a stillness to you, a rest, a sobriety to you. I think this is really important because in our culture, like we're just getting bombarded on social media. Hey, you should be upset about this. Be upset about this. Here's a news story. You should panic. You know, and everybody's trying to get us upset about stuff. But when we're centering ourselves around the Lord's Prayer, we're really being invited to a hallowing, a stillness, a calm. We embrace God as our heavenly father in in the first line of that prayer. We exalt God as holy. And then here's a third thing. Um, uh, The Lord's prayer says this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is really important. Our father. This is really important for those of us in the West, those of us in California, uh, those of us in churches like this, because we're so individualistic. It's interesting, Jesus recommended saying, our father. In first century Judaism, you never call God your personal father because that implied that you are from the same DNA family as God Almighty. We know that's true because one day Jesus was teaching and he said, my father, my father has been working up until this day, and so am I. And the religious leaders picked up stones to stone him to death because they said he was committing blasphemy, calling himself equal to God. That's what Jesus was doing. He was saying, I'm equal with God. I have the ability to call God my personal father. But when he tells us to pray the prayer, he says, say, our father. And what he's doing is he's reminding us and inviting us to do this, experience God in community. When we pray this prayer, it's a reminder that when I talk to God, I'm involved with all kinds of other people, and we're in this thing together. 
I had somebody come up to me a while back and, and said, hey, I've, I've been invited to pray the prayer um, at our Thanksgiving table. How should I pray? And I said, well, don't say, don't use the word I. This is not, God, I thank you that I'm here at Thanksgiving and I'm thankful for this food. That's you praying. If you're praying, you have to pray on behalf of everybody else. So say, we are thankful to be here. And he said, well, what if some of the people are thankful to be there? I said, then what could you pray that would represent them too? He said, some of the people at, at, some of the, people at the Thanksgiving table, they don't even believe in God. Okay, how can you pray a prayer that would include them also? And he was like, this is exactly why I don't want to pray at Thanksgiving. I mean, you know, it's way too complicated. I said, I know it's coming. Let me walk you through it. But here's the important thing. When you're praying in community, it is more difficult because you are being empathetic and respectful and thoughtful of other people. Of course, it's easier to pray your own thoughts and feelings. But this is what the Lord's Prayer is supposed to do. It's supposed to pull us together in ways that our individualistic natures never challenge us to. And the Lord's Prayer has the power to do that. I'll give you a quick example, and then we're going to pray this prayer together. I was uh, serving as a chaplain at a hospital. Before I was a pastor, I was serving as a chaplain in a hospital. And one night, I was in the ER, working in the ER, and this, this young man came in, Mexican-American young man came in. That'll be important later, that's why I say it. And um, he was wheeled into the trauma unit. He was non-responsive, wheeled into the trauma unit. I went back into the trauma unit to see, okay, what, what do you need from me as a chaplain? They said, um, we need you to support the family in the lobby. I was like, okay, great, I'm out there. We're walking down the lobby uh, to the main lobby, and the charge nurse says, there's about 23 family members in the lobby. Some are sleeping, some are angry, some are praying, and some are just really stoic. Can you help them? I was like, absolutely. We open up the doors and she says, by the way, none of them speak English. She puts her hand on me and she says, el pastor, good luck, and leaves. So I'm standing there, I'm going, okay, this is what I'm called to. And I look over at one of the women praying the rosary and I'm looking at the family and I said, I'm gonna take a risk here. So I know I sensed enough culturally that there was some degree of religious respect for authority figures within religious tradition. So I just motioned them over. I had memorized the Lord's Prayer in Spanish, but I didn't even need to use the whole thing. We gathered together in a circle and I said, Padre Nuestro, and they went to town. They prayed through the Lord's Prayer. You know what they prayed? They prayed about how God was their father. They prayed about how God was in heaven. They prayed for God's will, God's kingdom to come. They prayed for daily bread, what they needed right in that moment. They prayed for forgiveness of sins and to be forgiving of other people. They prayed to be delivered from temptation. And in that prayer, they united. At the end of that prayer, there was a sense of calm. There was a sense of collectedness, there was a sense of unity, not because the prayer was magic, but because it hit the points that were important to God and hit the points that should be important to us. That's the power of the Lord's Prayer, and that's what we're doing is we're asking God, in what you want for us in heaven, would you help us experience this on earth? So we're going to close now in praying the Lord's Prayer, and then singing a song that ties back into the message. So I'm going to ask our band to come out, and at Torrance, I'm going to invite the band to come out on the stage and kind of get ready for the, the song that we're going to sing together. Um, and we're going to pray this prayer together. Service isn't over yet, so hang on. Uh, would, you, would you stand with me here and at Torrance? We're going to pray this prayer together. Um, if you are with us for the first time, maybe you've never prayed before in your life. You've never talked to God before in your life. This would be a great way to start. And here's what we're going to do while we're praying. We're going to try to sync up in our timing. 
Okay, because here's one of the things about group prayer. Sometimes we get it, yeah, I know this prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then the other person's like, our Father who art in heaven. Like, what we're going to try to do is sync up and kind of say it at the same pace. Because that's also the group experience. That's what community means. I'm not going to go too far ahead of you, and I'm not going to be lagging too far behind. And in the beginning, it might feel very individualistic. But hopefully as we get into it, we experience a little bit more like community. We're going to pray this prayer, and then we're going to go into worship to close our service. Let's pray this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.